All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This is the Eccles Unlimited podcast. I'm your host, Terrence Eccles. And today we have a great episode for you, a great conversation between uh, myself and my good friend and coworker. Her name is Miranda Burt. Uh, Miranda is a strategy analyst for the Cleveland Guardians. She is also a former Division Three women's basketball player at the University of Chicago. She holds multiple individual records and spent time as a four-year starter for the Chicago program. That was one of the best in Division III at the time. Miranda and I had a great conversation today. We talk a lot about our basketball careers as well as what life is like post-basketball and then also talk about our passions beyond the court. Please take some time to learn more about Miranda and listen to a great conversation. Don't forget to like this video. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. Don't forget to leave five stars on apple or spotify if you like the episode and don't forget to comment if you if you like what you hear without further ado here's my episode with miranda burt but yeah wait okay so tell me about this i want to hear um men's you're the are you the only you're probably the only woman playing in this men's league right yeah, it's just me. Really? It's just me. So how is that? What is that experience like? Honestly, I think sometimes it's easier to play with guys. Okay. Than girls. Because okay. if you're a girl, like, playing basketball now. Yeah. You're very fundamental. Yep. Like, you definitely played. Yep. But guys playing in a rec league, probably, probably not. Like, they probably haven't played that much basketball. So in a way, since I only play now like once or twice a week, mm-hmm. sometimes it's easier for me to compete against guys. Really? Minus the athleticism. Right. Because I play, I'm better just at playing basketball. Yeah. And like, I mean, I'm sure you see it like playing in rec leagues. Yeah. It's easier. It's so easy to take advantage of people who just haven't played much basketball. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And well, like basketball iq sometimes is hit or miss in, in mm-hmm. some of these leagues especially like the men's league whatever, whatever yeah. you want to say but yeah i get what you're coming from just because like you're you're probably more skilled than what majority of the guys out there like a vast majority of them when it comes to just like from mm-hmm. basketball iq shooting and just like knowing spacing you know when mm-hmm. to make the right play when so it's like and then when you get into men's league by that time, like even yeah. athleticism is gone. So even you you can keep up there, you know? Yeah. Well, some, it depends on who I'm, who I'm guarding, which I don't know if all that says more about me or says or about the leagues that I'm no, playing in, but. It says a lot because you're a very good player. And then the games we played together, I remember one specific guy. I don't know if you remember this guy. We went like two weeks in a row. In this one I think I already know who you're talking about. <laughs> you, you cooked him one time. You cooked him one week. And then the next week, he, like, we played their team again, like, just in a random mm-hmm. pickup. And, like, he goes to guard someone else. <laughs> and his teammate's like, no, 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 no. You got to guard her because she cooked you last time. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, that's the thing, too, because you automatically get the worst – defender on you right. at least at first mm-hmm. so like you're kind of set up to start off hot and you know like as you play like if you hit your first shot or two you're gonna have a good you feel like you're gonna have a good day exactly so like automatically when you're up against the worst defender you're kind of automatically set up <laughs> to hopefully hit your first shot or two right right how does it feel like when guys like i guess underestimate you like that like is it does it put a chip on your shoulder is it funny to you where you're just like i'm better than you think or what what is that sort of feeling like it's i don't know i don't think about it too much it is frustrating like when you're playing and somebody you can tell like doesn't close out hard or doesn't go for a steal because mm-hmm. you're a girl and i'm like if i put the ball out in front of you and you can steal it yeah. steal it like that's right. not fun for you that's not fun for me yeah you're not getting anyone better by mm-hmm. doing that. And it's not, mm-hmm. yeah, it's not competitive game that way. You're just like, yeah, I get that. But, hey, I've I've shared the court with you, and I think a lot of people could say, like, they, they're they going 
go in their hardest in, in some, and you still cook them. So <laughs> I hope so. Right. I mean, I hope it goes. It definitely goes both ways. I get cooked sometimes too, but it's fine. I mean, it's basketball. Like, right. Yeah. If you don't get cooked. If you don't cook people, then. Mm -hmm. Question for you. Did you yeah. guys have practice players when you were at uh, Chicago? Uh -huh. Like men's practice players? Yeah, normally, like, from our football team or baseball team, like, whoever was in the off season. Got you. Okay. Yeah. And what was that experience like? Did they – what was – because I did it for a while, too. For like, oh, you did? Yeah. It was fun. It was really, really fun. Yeah. It was It was tough because we played, we played a style of defense where we'd pick up the ball and keep – basically, there was no help if the ball went middle. And we'd pick up the ball – at midcourt so were you just forcing everyone to the sidelines yeah if there's no help middle lines. oh and one pass away to nine. Oh man so if you okay. went middle you had no help or technically the help was on your side but in a deny so right you had to kind of arc them out of the paint yeah. if you wanted any prayer yeah of having anybody what's that what's that defense called i forget it's not pack line right no it's not pack we had a team Pope, who's like a D3 in Michigan, okay. who played it, and they were, I mean, they were really, really good. Mm -hmm. um, it's harder. I feel like it's harder for guys to play because it's easier to throw that skip pass. Oh, yeah. So so when you, you throw the skip pass, when? You get middle, and then you throw to one of the corners? Or you throw, like, if that person could go – um could drive like down on one side of the lane like mm. on the side that you're forcing them to uh-huh they could throw that skip pass but we have like the help the drop and so the idea is that that oh. skip will be not a straight line so that help can get out there to get a hand on it yeah or at least like close out right but like playing against male practice players yeah they... especially like the baseball guys they were I, you and wouldn't they, you didn't think they're so quick yeah. and i was the one picking up the ball at half court oh, so like playing man. that defense uh-huh i can i could try to get a few slide steps in but like it yeah. was almost impossible to which was great i mean it helped us but yeah. it was hard yeah yeah i think wow so i i didn't understand the whole male co practice player concept until mm -hmm. i got to college and i started to see it and then i eventually joined for a while it was it was so helpful for the girls especially mm -hmm. just because like you know you're never gonna see that in the game like yeah there was one guy who used to be on scholarship on the men's team and he became a practice player for the really <laughs> he was an That's amazing tough. athlete like just like he could take off mm -hmm. from like a few feet inside of the free throw line and still dunk like he was that type of athlete did he dunk on anybody he tried dunking a few times, but, like, he didn't quite adjust to the woman's ball mm -hmm. very well. So, like, he made some, but he would miss a bunch. It would just be <laughs> kind of funny because, like, they had, like, a no dunking policy. Mm -hmm. Because, like, with the woman's ball, I could even get up there. I was like. Yeah. Oh, but, so you were loving it. Right. But you didn't, you didn't dunk? No. I mean, I did if, I like, we were warming up or something like that. But mm -hmm. it was in, um. It wasn't something I tried to do when we were like playing in actual games and mm -hmm. practice and stuff. Um, but yeah, he would try. <laughs> yeah, because he was a foreigner. Like he was from a different country. You know, he mm -hmm. he didn't really care. He just was like, "I'm here to compete. I'm here to work out with the girls, help them get better." Yeah, why not dunk? Yeah, and he didn't he didn't care. So he he tried dunking a few times. I remember one time he he tried. It hit the back of the rim, and it went all the way to the half court. It was. <laughs> kind of funny because we turned it over and it was like man you had a wide open two points yeah. for us like we yeah. had a couple we had the same thing happen mm -hmm. a couple times it would i mean it'd be like a breakaway mm -hmm. and they dunk but it was I, like you said it was good because like you never you never see that in a game and just the athleticism alone like that limits so much of what you can do mm -hmm. like so many passes that you could normally make or right. so many like reads that you could normally make it just has to be that much better yeah and it makes you more like conscious of certain mm -hmm. things too. So then you're playing a more, I don't want to say like more reserved game, but you're playing like a smarter game, mm -hmm. I think, because 
if you see, you know, that skip pass get deflected a few times, you're like, maybe I'm not going to throw it unless I have it or it's wide open. Mm-hmm. And then that'll get your mind to maybe do other things like different ways to dribble out of traps mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah, it's totally. And it's so like, it's so nice in the women's game to have that. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. in the men's game, you don't. Like, you better hope your bench right. is really good. Yeah. But like us, we could, I don't know, you're always playing against the deep bench theoretically because you have the men's team. Exactly. Yeah, that's really cool. I think, you know, I think if that, if, if you're a former high school player and you still mm-hmm. want to play the game and you want to be in that like college basketball environment, definitely like consider mm-hmm. being a practice player because it's it's a fun experience. You get to mm-hmm. see things firsthand and you you learn if you really pay attention. You get to mm-hmm. learn different offenses and I think sometimes, especially on the women's side, like offenses are executed even better than men's mm-hmm. in my opinion. But yeah. Yeah, I like because they would come sit in on film sessions and. Oh, they would. Yeah, they would. So we'd we do our scout. I can't even remember what day. We do it for conference, like a couple days mm-hmm. before. So they'd come in, they'd watch film, um, and they'd run the sets. I mean, they'd have like our scouts. Right. And they'd run them, and then we were. They would never come in the next day because if we were traveling we'd have like a 6 a.m mm-hmm. and then by that point we had to know all the sets yep the next day yeah that's true. There. did you get quizzed a lot too on like scouts and stuff like that we never got quizzed but there were times where they'd change positions because a lot of times girls would just try to memorize their one spot Oh, for all the sets yeah. but if the coaches wanted you to guard a different position yeah and then switch you were exposed yeah so we didn't get quizzed but they would like throw some wrinkles at you mm, just so you're like getting a full so- sort of idea of what's going on on this particular play that's smart mm-hmm. that's really good um you guys got quizzed we didn't get quizzed no i don't i don't think any of us in I'll admit for on behalf of the rest of my teammates, we wouldn't do well on a quiz. Like you, I think a lot of us were better at knowing when something was in front of us. Mm -hmm. Like I could probably draw, like I could probably execute on the floor, Uh like all of our main plays from when I was in college better than I could draw them up. If that makes any sense. Oh, so you mean like writing? Yeah, Yeah. Like, just yeah, being able to like action do the actions and i think that's all that matters but at the same time like that's something i tried to develop and it just never it never really clicked um i don't know if i just wasn't the best at picking up offenses mm-hmm. but once once i like had done it a few times mm-hmm. i like knew it like i knew where everyone was i knew what mm-hmm. i was doing and i kind of had it figured out but it took like me actually doing it to like learn it instead of just like seeing it and studying Mm -hmm. it it wasn't enough i mean that's all you need to know though yeah i would rather have that than looking at a 2d sheet of paper right yeah yeah following that that. yeah exactly and it worked for at least that role like Uh when you're playing but i think coaches should know both like they should be able to do both so you know if that's something i want to do i got to get better at that um but yeah let's go back Okay. Okay. So that that was a good just sort of start, but I want to get into some of my deeper questions in terms of like, what was your early life like? Like Tennessee, you're from yeah. Knoxville. Are you from mm-hmm. outside of Knoxville, or like, what's where are you from? I say Knoxville. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm from like the western edge, so UT, the real UT, yep. is downtown Knoxville. So I'm like a twenty thirty minute drive, okay. depending on traffic. Gotcha. Okay. So is that a, like a short, that's a short drive in Tennessee. I'm assuming it's like 20 to 30 minutes. Yeah. I mean, you drive like everywhere yeah. there. So a short, yeah, pretty short drive, but we're like the edge of what you could call yourself being from Knoxville. Gotcha. Like the next town over, you probably wouldn't say that. Okay, cool. And um, what was that sort of like, like what opportunities did you have? Like I'm sure UT being so close uh-huh. to where you grew up, like, Oh, and 
I'm, you grew up in the golden age of Tennessee basketball, oh, yeah. like with Candace Parker, Pat Summit, and all of them. Like, what was that like? It was it was crazy. I mean, that I think is why I love basketball so much. But even so, like my parents, my dad played like no sports. My mom ran track at Davidson College, but like wasn't. I mean, track and basketball are two very different things. Yep. So no basketball history, but. I think some of the Pat Summitness seeped off. So when I was, this will sound like a weird story, so stay with me. Okay. But when I was like two or three, I had this Barbie UT cheerleader. And my mom came into my room one day and I had like taken the cheerleading outfit off. And my mom was like, <sighs> what are you doing? <laughs> okay. And I was like, Barbie doesn't want to cheer. Barbie wants to play basketball. Ooh, Okay. And so my mom was, like, kind of floored at that point because, like, my parents had never said anything about basketball. They were like, how does she even know what basketball is? <laughs> but, like, I think it seeped into me. And then just growing up, like, Candace Parker, Pat Summit, like you said, the golden age. Mm -hmm. Like, that's all I wanted to do. And we'd go to games completely sold out. Oh, and the wow. men, that was before Bruce Pearl kind of revived the men's program. Mm -hmm. But, like... And UT football wasn't doing as well. And so that was that was it. Like, yeah. That's all that I ever wanted to do was mm -hmm. play for Pat Summit, which didn't happen, unfortunately. Right. <laughs> but I think it like left a huge mark. Yeah, big time. And yeah, that's like outside of UConn, I think that's the only other place that can maybe have that sort of argument. But yeah, I remember those days too. I remember like watching Tennessee and Final Fours and National mm -hmm. Championship games and like hearing about how historic that team was mm -hmm. because like uh I always thought their uniforms were so like funky with the checkers on it like the, oh yeah the checkered yeah. what is what is the history behind that like uh the whole checkered thing at at UT it really like comes from the end zone um okay. but then like the lady vols also I don't know if you noticed the blue on yep. their uniform yeah the light baby blue yeah, yeah. Yeah, but we had, like, a separate men's and women's athletic department up until recently, which it was only us and then the other UT, actually, that did that. But I think, like, that stuck and was driven home mostly because of the support, not actually the lack of support. So all the women's programs, like, did really, really well and, like, prided themselves in yeah. being – Women, so I think like the Lady of All Blue, and when Pat Summit started, she like washed, cleaned, sewed all the uniforms no herself. Way. She was paid like a couple grand. So like <laughs> it literally started, and I think people just didn't want to get rid of the history since it was kind of built on her, and mm -hmm. didn't want to just conform to the men's side. Yeah, wow, I didn't know that that she had done that. What the heck? That's so yeah. cool. Yeah, she was just in grad school there, and they like she had just graduated, and just played in the Olympics. Wow! And then they'd offered her the coaching job. Wow! And then the rest is history. Yeah, the Literally. rest is history. Got you. Okay, so you tell your parents Barbie wants to play basketball. Uh -huh. Um, you know, you grow up obviously playing the game. What was it like in terms of like the middle school high school AAU like I'm sure you had those types of experiences mm -hmm. what was that like yeah so I actually I played a bunch of sports growing up basketball was always my favorite but it was not I was not, not the best way. at basketball really what was but your I best sport it. soccer actually I was a goalie okay um and loved it like definitely could have gone much much further with soccer mm -hmm. but I didn't love practice I love the oh. games but I loved basketball practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, give or take, there's a few practices that, right. that I didn't love, but <laughs> loved basketball practice. Yeah. Um, so I didn't even really play AAU until high school, but like I played basketball, um, was in a group of girls that I played soccer with that were really good athletes. They all went on to play Division One soccer for the most part, but we played in a boys' basketball league actually for a couple of years oh, before middle school. Oh, okay. So it like wasn't an uncommon thing. And yeah. then middle school basketball had a really great, tough coach um, who I still talk to to this day. He was awesome. He just coached us really hard, learned a lot just about 
basics of the game and then um, started playing AAU and then in high school had another awesome coach um, and bit, played basically with the same girls. Like we went all through the same school system. Oh, nice. So we were like friends for forever. There's still some of my really good friends, which is pretty cool. So we freshman, sophomore, junior year, we lost in the sub state. Every That's single tough. year. That's tough. Yeah. Um, a couple, there were a couple buzzer beaters involved that we were Ooh. on the wrong side of, but it was still great. Like it was definitely, I think the peak of my just enjoying basketball mm-hmm. through and through was definitely high school. And I got, I got a lot better. Like my role changed drastically too throughout the years, Yeah. which I think is part of why I love basketball is because I can be good at it, but really work hard Yeah, and see my effort pay off. Yeah. I think that's probably one of my favorite aspects about the game too. It's like you're able to physically see and feel the, like the fruits Mm -hmm. of your labor. You know what I mean? Like, I think just like getting in the gym, working on your shot and then being Mm -hmm. able to apply that to a game and like seeing your, Mm -hmm. seeing the ball go through the hoop. It's such a rewarding feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh man. Like it totally is. Yeah. Like nights alone, like Mm -hmm. late nights, long nights, ankle injuries, knee injuries, Mm -hmm. all that stuff you go through just to like try to be decent at this sport and you end up Mm -hmm. succeeding. It's the best feeling in the world. It's kind of crazy too. Cause you like go through a stage of like, all right, the first time you're going to like practice a shot mm-hmm. and then you get to a point where you're attempting that shot yep. in practice yep. and then you finally like feel like you have a green light yeah. to shoot that in a game, Yeah, which like could be years, right? years and years worth of time to actually literally shoot that shot that you started working on like years ago. Yeah. For me, it's the right hand floater. Oh yeah. I never developed a right hand. I, I had one in middle school. High school completely neglected it. Early college completely mm-hmm. neglected it. And by my senior year, like I just remember pickup games where like I'm like, you know what? I'm a wor- I've been working on it enough. Let me try it. <laughs> and I and it started working for me. And I started to be mm-hmm. able to shoot right hand floaters. For some reason, I had no touch with my right hand. It was weird. That is weird because you're right handed, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Normally, yeah. The floater is such a hard shot. Though. Yeah, exactly. Like people don't realize it's such an effective shot, especially mm-hmm. when you're this one of the smaller, you probably don't have this issue, but when you're one of the smaller players on the mm-hmm. court, it's like, geez, like what, what else, what other shot are you going to take? <laughs> it's <laughs> even crazy still watching it now mm-hmm. with like the lack of spin. Every time I see somebody shoot a floater, yeah. since I hardly ever, yeah, <laughs> unless unintentionally will put up a floater. Right, yeah. I'm like, wow, that's just like, is like, it going to go in? Yeah. Like, Did you see Kyrie the other night with the left-hand yeah. floater? Yeah. Yeah, like, left-hand floater, hook, like. <laughs> over this, over the biggest guy on the other team. People like, are giving him props for that, but I'm like, did he even, could he even see? I don't even know who's guarding him. <laughs> he's just throwing up and get lucky. Who knows? Like, it's no Kyrie Irving, so he's given the benefit of the doubt. Which he is, is with everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's crazy but yeah it's so rewarding but Mm -hmm. i'm surprised to hear the soccer thing when it came to soccer because that's another thing like the golden age of i guess youth women's soccer was Mm -hmm. during that time too with the u.s women's soccer Mm -hmm. team doing so well Were were you like a hope solo fan at the time oh yeah i mean i know she has a checkered past yeah she has a great book that she like she went to school at Washington uh, or Washington State, and mm-hmm. like her dad was homeless, like lived in the woods, but would come out to see her game. So like she's had a rough wow. life. Wow. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, she she was great. But I really played. I like my team was great. Mm-hmm. Um, we kind of had a bunch of girls thrown together, and like the fact that they all, when we were in third grade just happened to be on a team second grade and then they most of them went on to play division one soccer yeah it's crazy and I wasn't very good with my feet at all so they threw me in goal right and I was kind of at the point where like all right if I'm not good at this I'm going to be demoted to Mm -hmm. like the second team um and we played a really good team in like third grade and I was like pretty good at it we normally lost like 10 11 nothing to them and we lost like two three nothing okay 
So I was like, okay, I like this. Like yeah. I might, and no girl who plays with their feet ever wants to go in goal. So like I wasn't fighting anybody <laughs> yeah. for the job. Um, right. But like in middle school, I started to realize, I was like, this is not really, I don't love practice. I yep. just want to be a basketball practice and you're starting to choose. Yep. Um, but they said basically that there's this thing called ODP, which is like Olympic development mm-hmm. program. So they have regions and then there's like a national team that they pull from the regions. So supposedly, and I don't know if this is true. Like I never tried out for the region team, but they said I would have for sure been the region goalie and had a decent shot at like being the U whatever. No way. But basically in eighth grade, I only played like our state matches with our club team. Yeah. And then I quit my freshman, sophomore year of high school. And then junior, senior year, basically only went to games for our high school team because they needed a goalie. And so I worked it out with them where I could just like, or I would go to basketball practice or conditioning. Yeah. And then I'd show up to the last like 30 or so minutes of soccer. No way. And do both. Oh, soccer practice. Yeah. Okay. I thought you were going to say like you showed up for the. No, no, no. Half of Not the game. The game. <laughs> I would go to all the games. Okay. I was there. So it was kind of like the best of both worlds, but I just got to a point where I felt like I was not in the gym like I should be for basketball even though I knew basketball wise I would never the ceiling was so much lower Mm -hmm. for me yeah and yeah I mean now that you explain like the Olympic development program that would have been like I mean who knows right like I don't know if coaches would just say that to get me to keep playing right or not but yeah but I mean it and kudos to you for like understanding like you love a sport you wanted mm-hmm. to play basketball that's your dream so you know you might have had an opportunity here who knows mm-hmm. but you did what you love and you probably got more enjoyment out of it yeah i'm so glad yeah that i did my parents were great too because they were like you know you always could if you wanted to go back and play soccer but like you shouldn't just do it you're right right you shouldn't just because... do it because you have a chance to you know do whatever mm-hmm. yeah um but wow that's really that's pretty cool um you know i'm sure your recruiting process was probably crazy all over the place like you picked an amazing school academically and then i know you played so, at some pretty mm-hmm. at some pretty in some pretty uh, you know amazing situations basketball wise too as well uh, i know you made the ncaa tournament right we did, yeah. Every every year, we didn't go far, but we made. It. Right, but like, hey, the NCAA it. tournament is the NCAA tournament. So, what was that recruiting process like? And like, what is it like, especially going to a very high academic school like Chicago? Oh yeah, good question. It was like, and I'm sure yours was too. It was crazy, um, but I think like recruiting wise, we Princeton actually had come out and had seen me maybe freshman, sophomore year, when mm. I had played really well. And offensively, I developed pretty late. I, like, okay. was 100% defensive player. Like, started on my high school team starting my sophomore year, but, like, basically just was there to shut down the other teams. I maybe averaged five points, yep. four or five points. Um, so they came out when I actually scored, which was crazy. So oh, they nice. were interested. I went up to visit a couple times and then went to their elite camp. That was right around the time, I don't know if you remember, they like went undefeated in the regular season. Obama's niece was on the team. What? No. I only remember Princeton in college, and they were really good then, too. Yeah, they were like, which I'm sure was kind of fed off of that, but like any prayer that I had of going there went away. So I realized that at that camp that I went to, which was a bummer. (laughs) These coaches aren't paying attention to me. Right. But my coach was there. They brought in a bunch of like um, academic D3 yep. coaches to lead all the teams. And so she was there. And I had honestly never heard of University of Chicago oh, before. Really? This was like going into my senior year. What? Yeah, I never heard of them. Like didn't know that they were a good school Yeah. or anything. What the heck? So, you, wow, that's that's surprising to me. Like what, mm-hmm. what was your mind on then at that point before you even – found out about Chicago like I know Princeton was on your mind but like where was your mindset at that time 
Before I found out about Yeah, before you knew what Chicago was. Were you just like, I'm going to go to Princeton? Or was it just like a quick pivot from Princeton to Chicago? I really wanted to go to Princeton. I like studied really hard for the ACT. Like felt like I had all my ducks in a row. Like they would send me letters and like we're checking my transcripts. We get pulled out of class. And so I was riding high. I was like, I'm going to Princeton. This is perfect. Yeah. Always wanted to play Division One basketball, and then I went to the camp, and I just knew I was like, "Gotcha, this sucks." Yeah. Like, I am not going to Princeton. <laughs> right. So it kind of was a rude awakening, but I was also um, kind of talking to Davidson for a couple sports. My high school soccer coach had like sent out things. Okay. But I was like, I don't want to play soccer. Right. And then I ran track in high school too, so I was like. Oh, kind geez. of triple threat. There are a few feelers yeah. out there. It's the best triple threat I have right. on the court. <laughs> um, and then there was like a few E twos that I was looking at, but they weren't academically like it was hard to compare them. Mm-hmm. And then I looked at Chicago, WashU, Emory, all in the UAA, all in like the same conference. Yeah, so it's kind Very of between all schools. of those. Yeah. But Chicago, I don't know. I just had like a feeling. I feel like everything kind of happens for a reason. And I just like felt like I knew that's where I was supposed to go. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. I And then it's, it's like the best feeling when you like realize like, yeah, I picked the, picked mm-hmm. the right school. Like I'm going to be here for a while. I'm going to stick it out for a while. That's, that's really good. What, well, that's not how I felt when I got there. But, oh, really? Yeah. So what was that like then? I just remember playing pickup, like getting there. And then it was also just kind of a culture shock. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about that. Cause you're coming from Tennessee. Like I'm sure you mm-hmm. have like open, I'm not even sure what Tennessee is like, but like, is it like open roads, flat, flat land? Like, what is it like? down there? Like the middle and West part, mm-hmm. but Knoxville is like very hilly and mountain, like the smoky okay. mountains are there. Oh, okay. But yeah. Yep. Chicago is like, you right. see for miles yeah. and miles, yeah. which is crazy. Um, but yeah, it was... Is that what they call it, Rocky Top? Yeah, Rocky yeah. Top. Mm-hmm. Got you. Okay. Look at you. You're a TC right. fan already. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm an Auburn fan, but... You can be... I pull for Bruce. Okay. You can be a oh, Tennessee fan. Oh, fair enough. Fan. Fair enough. Okay. Because I know how people in the SEC get... We can agree on one thing. We both hate Georgia. There we go. We do. We both hate Georgia. Perfect. And St. Peter's, right? Yeah. And St. Peter's. <laughs> I forgot. Yeah. No, I really don't like St. Peter's. But yeah, you're right. Yeah. There we go. We agree on a couple things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was I don't know, it was I think for me, like my high school team was very much um we all had like the same faith background and we all were very like I mean everyone at Chicago was good students too but good students no one was crazy partiers and so I think I got to Chicago and I was like man I'm not good at basketball anymore and everybody's like going out we had this orientation week so everyone would go out every single night week silly week or whatever it is (sighs) yeah yeah so I was like huh I don't know how long I'm gonna last I was like should I call other coaches oh, no. i mean I, I wasn't actually going down that path yeah. but i remember like wow i thought this would be so great mm-hmm. so it was more just a, like a co- culture shock like obviously freshman year you go in you're not gonna unless you're like going to duke or kentucky you're mm-hmm. not, freshmen aren't the best players on the team anywhere um so you have that aspect of it but like not only is that but you're just going through a huge culture shock at the time too yeah, I think exactly that. And we only could travel, it was like 12 or 13, maybe 14 or 15 of us. And I was like convinced. I was like, I'm not even going to travel. And it turned around. Like it was fine. Right. I'm not as good in pickup anyway, but like in a yeah. more structured setting. Yeah, exactly. A little bit better. But yeah, I was not. When I showed up and my math class was so hard. Really? So hard. Yeah, I was yeah. in the average math class and I went and cried to them and I said, Pull me down. It was all like Greek symbols. <laughs> it's like where yeah, the numbers go. Right. This isn't math anymore. <laughs> where the numbers go? Yeah. You know, I was trans. I was literally translating my math homework. I no had, way. What the heck? And that was for a week, and then I dropped out. You dropped it. Yeah. Okay, I got that. Yeah, and yeah, because not only do you have the struggles of 
you have the struggles of adjusting to college basketball, struggles of adjusting, moving from Tennessee to Chicago, and then mm-hmm. you also have the struggles of adjusting to a school like Chicago that's very like prestigious and high academic and all this stuff. So yeah, that I felt could... like I fell on my face. Yeah, at first I got up, but like I definitely fell right. on my face. Yeah, I mean, hey, kudos to you for figuring it all out and you know sticking mm-hmm. it out too because like i feel like with today's day and age kids experience that they're like okay i'm gone and like they just mm-hmm. go find their comfort again we're like sometimes mm-hmm. in order to grow you have to like sit in that uncomfortable that that uncomfort mm-hmm. which was great i do i grew i feel like so much mm-hmm. but it definitely was uncomfortable yeah at times but you're totally right and no one wants to do it like mm-hmm. when you're in that spot you don't want to do it mm-hmm. I don't know if I wanted to do it, but I was kind of forced to. Yeah. I had to do it. I you had, had to figure, to figure it, out. it out. Yeah. yeah. And, and what was it like once you finally did turn the page? And what did you do to turn the page? Because I'm sure people can take something from that and grow, hopefully, from mm-hmm. just listening to how, how you were able to do it. <sighs> yeah, that's a good question. I met um, Oliver, actually, my boyfriend, right? when I started and like outside of like dating, I wouldn't even say that, but I think we just became really good friends Mm -hmm. and we had a similar mindset about things, just like how the school was and how I was like, wow, I just didn't like, I just didn't feel alone Mm -hmm. anymore, Mm -hmm. which I think just having somebody feeling that there's somebody in your corner who's in a similar spot, not somebody that you can call. That's not, around right who can't exactly yeah. relate to you like this person mm-hmm. can relate to you on multiple levels mm-hmm. really helped that yeah. was like just i think great to have somebody to relate to even if it never like blossomed into right. anything else like it <laughs> it really helped me yeah and then you know basket i mean the math class i got yeah. into a easier math class so that was what i did <laughs> Smart. there yeah um there you go basketball was good like once we started practice we had our mile tests which I was worried about passing but I passed which I felt like just gave me confidence and then our first practice went well and I just started to like gain I think I was like okay I I can do this like I can really I really can do this Mm -hmm. and seeing it and I was like all right just do it now Mm -hmm. yeah and I think you know bringing up Oliver's a great point, just not only because like having friend like having friends yeah. in general in college was like for for me mm-hmm. like in, in my situation, like just like making friends outside of basketball. So it was That's like such a good point. Yeah, like uh-huh. having people who I could come home and talk about basketball, but like they can't be like, oh, but you threw it off your foot in practice today and what what happened mm-hmm. there and blah 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 blah. They didn't care. They're like, Yeah. You play basketball. Mm-hmm. You're good. like they didn't know. They yeah. didn't care. So it was like, you know, you you just mm-hmm. got to enjoy and then like you said, you you and him are so like minded. Finding those like minded mm-hmm. people in college is so hard. Like it's so tough. Yeah. And especially well, mm-hmm. for some people it is, and then some people it's not. But like I think a lot of us instead of trying to find people that Mm -hmm. we can uh, gel with and relate to, we find a group of people that we like and then we Mm -hmm. assimilate and make ourselves like them. That's such a good point. And yeah. And you start to Mm -hmm. fall into things that you don't like to do. You don't want to do. Mm -hmm. You don't need to do like (laughs) people are like people. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, you have a, a similar experience but people ask me about like oh what was your college experience i was, I was like great mm-hmm. and then I, i'll you know get to talking to someone and, and i'm like yeah i went to my first college party two weeks before i graduated <laughs> <laughs> and they're like what and they're and i was like yeah and i went to the bar for the first time in grad school and they're like wait what what else did you do in college i'm like you don't have to do that stuff in college if you find the right people yeah, that's such a good point. I don't think I realized that because the first night and basketball is weird. Like you're you come in with the built in group of friends, mm-hmm. but it's not 
And also, and I know you think the same way. Like some of my teammates are like my greatest friends now. Yep. But like you come in and you like have these friends, but you don't really know what they're like. Mm-hmm. You don't really have any commonality except you're on the basketball team yep. together. So like they went out every night of the first week. Oh, and geez. so I didn't end up going out every night, but like, I was like, is this what I'm going to just have to do? Because this is like, you're part of this group. Yeah. Not that I was like doing all the same things to the same extent, but I think meeting Oliver was like, wait, everybody here doesn't right. do that. Like, yeah. I don't have to like even just go and be there. Right. Like I don't have to go out. Yeah. Yeah. Which sounds so dumb to say, but I think like you come into this group yeah. and you feel like you need to be a part of the group and then you're like, right. you can, you can still be a part of, of the group and you don't have to do everything. Mm-hmm. Like, you're you're shouting out to Oliver. Shout out to my friend to my friends Megan and Jules, just because they always ask to come on this podcast and they never come on. Oh, I hope I, they listen to this episode. Right, and I refuse to have mm-hmm. them on all the time. But hey, we're talking about something that literally applies mm-hmm. to both of us and both of our situations. And you had him, and I had them. And yeah, it's it's literally like you find people, and mm-hmm. you know you can still be. And then the best part is like still having friends who mm-hmm. may do stuff that's not the same as you or you know may Mm -hmm. have whatever but like no one's gonna judge you no one's gonna hate you no one's gonna really you know care yeah which is so easy like when i feel like the people who got stuck in like a valley in their college experience Mm -hmm. it's because you only if you only hang out with people play basketball you only do basketball and then if you end up quitting or it's not going well like there's you don't yeah. have anything else yeah. but at least if you have other friends or other things you can be like all right basketball kind of right. sucks right now yeah. but like i have other things yeah and i and that is so important especially for student athletes to hear mm-hmm. that like i get it most majority of your time is going to be taken by your sport mm-hmm. but the time that's not please dedicate it to finding your group of friends that's not in that sport because then you won't enjoy your college experience if you don't have those people Mm Because basketball or whatever sport you're doing is not always going to be, you know, sweet roses and candy. No. And it ends for everybody. I mean, even LeBron, he's probably stringing out for a couple more years, but it ends. And Bron is one in a billion, like literally Mm -hmm. one of a kind. Like that's the most extreme example. And you're right. Mm -hmm. Like the ball stops bouncing for everybody. And yeah, that's... That's such a good point. And I'm glad you brought that up because it's something that mm-hmm. I think needs to get talked about more because not every college student understands it because coaches aren't conveying that to them. And mm-hmm. then also, like, I'll be honest, most college students don't convey that to them because most college students just follow the group and do stuff that they know that they aren't, doesn't suit them. Yeah, it's so hard. And no one admits it either. Mm -hmm. because you don't know no one says that they're just following the group yeah exactly yeah like no one no one wants to raise their hand and say i don't want to do this right (laughs) like everybody just follows the group and then afterwards you're talking to people and you're like wait you don't want to do that either (laughs) or like (laughs) right you find out so much later but i feel like no one ever says anything yeah in college yeah really good point really good point and yeah i i want to keep the conversation going Mm -hmm. but yeah i think that's super important that that we touch on that at least Mm -hmm. but um so i know i alluded to it earlier you played in a few i i only thought it was like one or two uh, ncaa tournaments you played in a tournament every year every year yeah we we did which is weird in so in d3 i have my gripes this will be my like plug to change (laughs) d3 tournament selection let's hear it but you qualify based on you're their conference champ um and we didn't have a conference tournament so we were like the old ivy league oh so we were like that or you qualify based on regional rankings so they've changed it now but i think there were like seven regions and you're on a board basically ranked mostly ranked by how many wins you have against other regionally ranked mm-hmm. teams like within and outside of your region and then head to head and they just basically pull top liners off the board and then you're sent very geographically, which obviously like happens in Division One too. Mm-hmm. But like you're 
very much set geographically. So like one gotcha. year we matched up in the second round. We had to we were top ten in the country and we had no to go way. play away in the second round and meet like a top or maybe top three or top four team. Oh uh, so, yeah. Just because of like our region. Because it's geographically where you guys were. It wasn't just mm-hmm. like, you know, if you think about the NCAA tournament, normally mm-hmm. that team would be a one seed. You guys would be a three seed. Mm-hmm. Normally a one and a three seed wouldn't meet until maybe quarterfinals. Like, or yeah, two, two da- down because, you know, 16 yeah. seeds, you're, you're not playing, you know, a top seed until a few rounds. But wow. Yeah. So you we'd play early. So my freshman year, we barely snuck into the tournament. That wasn't one of the years. We didn't win our conference. We could have, and we lost like a 10-point lead in the last minute to our rival in our last regular season game. That was basically the championship. Wash you. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. In yeah. Uh, St. Louis. Yeah. So, okay. I know your conference is super unique just – even on any scale, like Division mm-hmm. One, Division Two, Division Three, it doesn't matter. Can you talk a little bit about the teams in your conference and like why it was such a unique sort of layout? Yeah, we and that was kind of one of the reasons I chose it because it almost going in had the Division One feel because yeah. we would travel pretty far to every team in our conference. There was Wash U, um, then everyone else that we played. You have like a travel partner. We played Thursdays. And Sunday, so you were paired and would play a team on Friday. Okay. And then Sunday, so you'd practice in the morning on Thursday, fly out normally at like 10 or 11 a.m. after mm. you had a class, um, play like a travel partner would be um, Case Western here in yep. Cleveland. And then Carnegie Mellon was a pair, NYU and Brandeis. And then really good academic schools, yeah. too. Emory and Rochester, which was kind of the worst because, like, Atlanta. And then mm-hmm. upstate New York was, like, a <laughs> <laughs> traveling a lot right. in the weekend. Um, but it was fun because everybody was, like, kind of on the same page. And there were a lot of, like, good basketball players that just wanted a good school. And Wash U, actually, they had a coach who jumped um, from Wash U to Illinois, like, D3 to D1. Oh, wow. yeah. who was incredible. And she would just poach. They'd have, like five to ten division one transfers every year like coming in oh man they were insane and she was a great great coach she was tough to play against mm. yeah it's always tough when they get those like drop downs or got you know people who mm-hmm. who yeah that's tough yeah they they were good um mm. they were good but they, she left after my freshman year so they okay. dropped off a little bit they were still really good though yeah gotcha Wow. So, okay. And yeah, I think it's important to highlight that because people hear, you know, oh, it's a division three conference, Mm -hmm. but no, like a lot of those teams could probably beat some of the teams in my conference. I'm not even going to lie. Like, I think, you know, you, U of R, U of R is such a good school, especially Mm -hmm. from where I come in, come from Mm -hmm. in upstate New York, but you don't realize like you could be playing Chicago, Emory, Washu, like Uh other really good schools in like, getting that travel experience, seeing these other big cities and mm-hmm. at the division three level too. So it's like, yeah, I think not enough people are giving conferences like that. Mm-hmm. And um, another conference I'll give a shout out to in division three is uh, the NESCAC. Oh, they're good. Yeah. The NESCAC schools are all really good. Right. Exactly. And those are very high academic mm-hmm. schools too. So it's like, and those are all around new England area mostly, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's not the same travel wise, but mm-hmm. it's high level basketball, it's high level mm-hmm. academics. Like sometimes you gotta give that a look before you give, you know, no offense to division some of the division two schools, but like aren't the best academically sometimes. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of, you know, you gotta pick and choose what do you want to be your future and what do you want mm-hmm. to help set you up. I would have totally I mean, D three just like doesn't sound very good. Like I, I could not even think about the idea of D3 and then I had a teammate a year above me um Sue Kim who was an amazing amazing point guard Mm -hmm. and she decided to go D3 like she was kind of in the same situation like had some 
D1 looks probably could have walked on mm-hmm. somewhere, but went D3. And I was like, wait, if she's going D3 and she's saying all of these good things about it, yeah. it's probably not that bad. And right. then I looked into it. I was like, well, I could play, I yeah. come in and play, get all of these great things and still like have a great experience regardless. Yeah. Like I should just do it. And I'm so glad that I did, mm-hmm. but no one wants, I mean, everyone wants to go D1. It's always D1, D1, D1. Right. Yeah. And yeah, I think I hope that sort of mentality kind of dies at some mm-hmm. point and people just acknowledge good schools for good schools and good basketball for good basketball. And if you have both, mm-hmm. like take it. So yeah, that's a good yeah. point. Why not? Right. Why not? Exactly. So, yeah, I like I like the fact mm-hmm. that you're able to do that and experience things and see different cities. What What was your thoughts about um, Rochester? How did, <laughs> the did city or the school? Both. Um, because that's so close to where I grew up. I just I'm curious. Oh, interesting. So we never um, we never really got to explore, which is I'm sure like you guys we never really got to explore the city. Mm-hmm. Like in New York, we had maybe three hours where we could go oh. out. Oh, right. And NYU too. Yeah. 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 yeah NYU. And then I guess we didn't get to see anything. There was no other time where we just got time to go out in the city. Mm-hmm. Um, so we didn't really see Rochester. We always went to Dinosaur Barbecue. Yes. Okay. Which was there delicious. At least. Wow. Okay. So this is someone from you Tennessee. Don't like- no, 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 no. I'm glad that you're saying this because sometimes people will discount barbecue just because it's upstate new york and dinosaur barbecue is dinosaur barbecue but i'm glad this is someone from tennessee Mm -hmm. who probably knows good barbecue says dinosaur barbecue is pretty good because i'm a big fan of it it's incredible it's all different right like the sauce is all different but like Mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's worse i'm not a huge fan of the sauce if we're being so honest the barbecue think of what it even tasted like but like the ribs are always on point Mm -hmm not they're not it's not like it's not messy food either which sometimes Mm -hmm. you'll get when you get barbecue it's very it's very uniform it's good like Mm -hmm. good char on the meat good seasoning on the meat Mm -hmm. uh the sides are the sides are so good yes exactly so i like i'm a big fan Mm -hmm. of dinosaur barbecue and i'm glad that you like dinosaur barbecue yeah dinosaur barbecue is incredible and then their gym i don't know have you ever been to rochester's gym I don't think so. No, I haven't. What? It's like old school. The ble- It has these bleachers, but then like the court is kind of it's probably 10 or 15 feet down below the bleachers. So no oh. seats right there. It has these old NCAA logos, like the locker rooms. You have to like walk downstairs and then walk back upstairs to get out. Interesting. So they're kind of by the court, but you can't enter directly in so it's like a very old school gym should look at a picture it's cool yeah it's probably them and then wash you my favorite gems oh nice i've definitely seen pictures but yeah i i don't think i've like really internalized it and like Mm -hmm. taking a look at the details it sounds like a very like unique sort of style you just feel like you're going back in time really okay that's cool too i like that yeah have you ever realized that most NBA arenas you're playing below ground? Honestly, no. I've right? never thought about that. That's kind of crazy, <laughs> though. Like you walk in and thinking, I'm just thinking from Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse, and I'm mm-hmm. and I'm sure there's other arenas like this. Like for an arena that's as big as it is, mm-hmm. it doesn't look as big from the outside. Even the ballpark, you're playing yeah. like below, because you walk in at a level. And that's the street mm-hmm. level. But then you have to walk down to get to the playing surface. I love how we walk in. Yeah. Our ballpark. Yeah. I think that's so cool. But there's also something about just like an imposing stadium mm-hmm. or arena that you walk up on and you're like, that's huge. Yeah. From the outside. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I've sure. never thought about that though. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. And. And that must be how somehow like how how they're able to like make these giant stadiums not like huge. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like some of them are still really big, but it's like they don't make them as tall because you don't need to make them as tall because you're mm-hmm. building, you know, a good amount of seats and the, and the playing surface is below ground. It doesn't even feel like it. That is crazy. We 
makes me think NYU was building a new gym. And I think theirs was going to be like this. We always would play at a, another. It was like a D2 school. I think they were Hunter College. Hunter they College. Were Interesting. But okay. they were like 10 or 15 floors below um, like ground level. Yeah. If you take an elevator down, like phones, nothing, no service. Like we couldn't <sighs> play any music in the locker room because oh, we lost service no on everything. Yeah. yeah. They didn't give us the Wi Fi. So. <laughs> oh man. That's crazy. And yeah, I mean some some of the gyms are like mm -hmm. that. Like I remember Columbia, it's like you pull up at a random corner and you walk mm -hmm. in, you go up a few mm -hmm. sets of stairs and all of a sudden you're in a gym and it's like what? Like That's where they played the Ivy League tournament at, right? Columbia? Yeah, this past. Oh, they probably did. Right? Yeah, they probably host it. Yeah. Because I know different schools host it different years. Um, Princeton's gym is so weird. Kind of. Well, I've never been to the Carrier Dome. But that's what yeah. I thought when I walked in. Like yeah. small, small version. Right, like a much smaller version of the Carrier Dome. And yeah, that's a good point. It's just mm -hmm. like a giant, like, it's a whole track and field you can fit in there. Like. I didn't expect Princeton's uh, gym to be like that because, like, you see it mm -hmm. on film and then you walk in, and you're like, "Wait, what?" That is the craziest thing: seeing a gym on film, and then you walk in yeah. and you're like, "Is this the same completely place? different?" <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, yeah, it's some some of these places. It's such a cool thing about sports. It's like the mm -hmm. uniqueness of each venue. It is, especially basketball is interesting because I feel like. It's one of the few, I guess, basketball and hockey, the few that the surrounding, like, gym can be so different, mm -hmm. but the court's the same. Yep. But even, like, soccer, the size yeah. of the field could be so different. Yeah. Or, like, all these things could be different. But basketball, I feel like there's an element of the it gym, to, which yeah. the gym matters so much, like, the depth perception, the yep. lights. Exactly. Yeah. And then some sports have, like, inside, outside, basketball's all inside. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I think I get that. And yeah you're right like the depth mm -hmm. perception will mess with you bad yeah the lights everything mm -hmm. the coloring of the wall behind mm -hmm. it it's like even that'll mess with you sometimes like i don't know if, how you felt about the Cavs practice gym that we played in our employee tournament in but i thought that was pretty good and then i go and mm -hmm. i play a, in our rec league at um the lakewood elementary school and it's like ugh, like cannot shoot here yeah, there's some that are just like poor one. Like I don't I feel like if you don't play basketball, you'd be like Right. You're no, like, there's what are no you way. complaining about. Yeah. But right. I guarantee we'd shoot probably like twenty five, thirty percent better mm -hmm. in a place like the Cavs practice gym mm -hmm. versus like Lakewood yeah. Elementary. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. There's there's such thing as shooters gyms. It's a real thing. Mm -hmm. It's a it's definitely a real thing. And so uh you know, looking back at, on your career, what are like, what are some of your favorite moments that you had in college? In college, that's a good question. Um, my freshman year, so we snuck into the tournament. We were matched up with a um, team that made it to the Final Four oh, the year wow. before and upset them in the first round, which nobody okay. expected us to do. Yeah. They were like talking at these like three talk shows which probably only a few parents listen to <laughs> they basically like said on that sh one of the bigger shows like we're talking about the matchup of Warburg who's a team and then St. Thomas okay in the second round yep like and we hadn't played our game with them yeah we're like how do you know they're gonna <laughs> make Ooh, it to the second round yeah that's a good point um, yeah so that was fun um I'm trying to my sophomore year we were undefeated in conference and won a conference championship which hadn't been done in a long time which yeah. was a fun memory and That's then of awesome. course playing in the tournament and then senior year which I really don't care about individual records but like I set the record uh, or set a couple to set one of the records for most threes in a game no way how many did you hit just eight so nothing crazy what <laughs> nothing crazy you said but... just eight <laughs> Nothing crazy, just Nate. Nothing crazy. No, what nothing the heck, crazy. Miranda? What? Like, that's a huge eight threes? What the heck? Like, that's 24 points. Yeah, it was. Well, 
but I think I'll take it back to I feel like what we started talking about because even so in middle school I never attempted a three freshman year of high school I don't think I attempted one either sophomore year maybe and again I started my sophomore year Mm -hmm. maybe attempted 10 on the season maybe maybe as a starting guard junior year maybe maybe won a game maybe again was role player maybe average six points a game but this whole time I was working like I'd go I remember my dad and I he'd rebound for me we go to this one um like church gym and Mm -hmm. I'd make 10 at like the five typical spots but that took forever yep forever I'd hit the backboard on the side I was working 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 and then finally my senior year in uh, high school I became like I had to I just had to become because we lost so many people yeah I had to be able to score the basketball yeah I think coaches were still surprised (laughs) that I like could shoot and then I got to college and people would point and be like shooter shooter you know yeah yeah I'm like me (laughs) me yeah and it was crazy like no one I think there were a lot of people who didn't think I'd ever be a score, which not that I was ever this incredible score. Mm. So to go from that to being able, yeah, to the, setting that, I was like, wow, it really, it just felt like this hard work really paid off. Yeah, that's and like easy. again, I don't care really that it was this individual record, but like for me personally, I think it just felt good to have like a day that all this thousands and thousands of shots, fruits of your labor. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. That's awesome. I mean, to hit eight, though, you know, you can't be playing anyone that's really playing tough defense. Dang, Miranda. To take that keep, many. Why do you keep trying to downplay it? Like, you... If what? you watch the film, Terrence, you would say the same thing. No. It's honest. It's all honesty. I don't think so. I don't know. I'd I have to see the film still. But, yeah, eight threes is ridiculous. That's impressive. And you, you're just like, yeah, I just broke a couple records. What are your other records? I had threes, and they tied for threes in the season. And how many was that? wasn't that many. It was like 63, 62, maybe? 62 in how many games? In 26, maybe? 26 games. So that's almost three, games, three threes a game at probably an impressive percentage as well. Probably like hair under 40. But, I mean, Caitlin Clark just said, the men's record for threes in a – or men's and women's record for threes in a season. Okay. And it was like – it was basically she added 100 <laughs> to my number. <laughs> so I'm humbled. Right. Okay. okay. But that's Kaylin Clark. She's one in a billion. And then also think about the offense that they have to run in order for her to do that. You know what I mean? Like you're getting your shots within the flow of an offense. The offense mm-hmm. is her. Get, get her that's the ball true. in an outlet. Get her the ball mm-hmm. to bring it up. Let her make her move or run the set Mm -hmm. for her to get whatever action you need her to get in order for her to make a play. Whether it's Mm -hmm. dish, shot, drive, whatever. It's all her. So, like, of course she's going to have amazing numbers if it's all her. And because she's Mm – the only reason she has that is because of how skilled she is. Like, I don't want to downplay anything she does. Mm -hmm. But then I also want to focus on the fact, like, Usage percentage is a thing. Usage is. rate is a thing that will influence your numbers. It is. Synergy doesn't lie. Yeah. Synergy does <laughs> synergy not lie. Synergy does not lie. Exactly. Exactly. But yeah, that's very impressive. And I knew, I remember Kenneth told me that one time that you had broke some three point records at Chicago. And I was like, I didn't know what they were. So it's awesome to hear them now. And to hear you talk mm-hmm. about it, it's like, you need to give yourself more credit. I don't know. I don't know. I feel like now, too, I'm like, man, I can't shoot anymore. I mean, you played with me sometimes. I haven't. We played a few hours of pickup, and I haven't hit a three. So I feel like it's another – sometimes it feels like another life ago. Steph Curry scored zero points in a game in college. Really? They double teamed him. I mean, it's helpful context. I was never, I was never guarded like Steph Curry. I can guarantee you that. Yeah, but still, like even everyone has a game where they're just like, or a day mm-hmm. or whatever, where, you know, mm-hmm. 
is just not going to be there. And I think the beauty of basketball and like what the really, really good players and great mm-hmm. players do is they eventually like they acknowledge that and then they're able to like bounce back so quickly. Uh-huh. Like whether it's a season, whether it takes a season, mm-hmm. whether it takes a week, whether it takes a game, whether it takes a quarter, like they just bounce back and like, mm-hmm. it's like nothing. Like every shot, like you can miss your first 13 shots, but if mm-hmm. you make that, if I make that mm-hmm. 14th, you're going to hear it. Oh yeah. And you're due for it. <laughs> exactly. You're due for a make. Exactly. So, and I think that's another thing that young basketball players need to understand too. Like you're not going to make every shot. Like mm-hmm. the best shooters in the world shoot 40%. That's less than half. Yeah, so. you're never going to play a perfect game. Exactly. Even if you go, I mean, whatever for whatever from the field, if you're 100%, it's still not a perfect game. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I think that's important to understand. It's important to acknowledge. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think the knowledge of basketball itself and what the game brings you and teaches you is unbelievable. It's almost mm-hmm. unlike any other sport I've ever played. It's the best teacher for life. It totally, totally is. I mean, everything. And even I feel like it's hard sometimes now. You almost expect, I don't want to say too much of people because I think you should hold people to a high standard. But you know, I almost expect to interact with people like I'm in a team setting. Mm-hmm. Oh, right. So like when someone doesn't hold up their end of the bargain or do what they said they were going to do. Right. You'd think like, oh, if you don't hold up your end, yeah. I can voice that to you whereas sometimes Mm -hmm. it's like you know especially in a corporate Mm -hmm. professional environment you can't exactly do that yes like a different way of interacting even though like we're part of a bigger team Mm -hmm. but it's not the same but I feel like you learn so much like you have to you have to get on the line you have to go alongside everything with your teammates no matter if you're playing 40 minutes a game yep or not at all. Yeah. Yeah. I, and yeah. And yeah. Uh, adjusting to life after basketball is another thing I want to talk about, which is we can we can get mm-hmm. into that now. What has that been like for you in these past few years? And mm-hmm. how have you adjusted? I mean, I know you're still lighting up men's leagues across Northeast <laughs> Ohio, but go ahead, like. What has that been like, that transition? It's been – it's kind of crazy because we lost our last game. Um, we never made it past the second round of the tournament, but we should have – we thought we should have hosted my senior year. But anyway, we get shipped off to Northeast Ohio to Baldwin-Wallace. No way. Okay. We won our first round game handily. And there um, – because the D3 tournament started earlier mm-hmm. than D1. And then we lost um, with a nice – banked in three from like the wing against our zone we lost to Baldwin Wallace um what the heck like three days later I think the world shut down yeah so initially I have to say selfishly I was happy that the tournament got canceled (laughs) for everybody else yeah um if we would have won and it got canceled I'd probably still not have closure right and be mad about it but it was weird like I classes were canceled in person so I packed up went home our coach like took another job Mm. so everything was completely different and I think everybody was adjusting to life so like the first year when I went to grad school it just felt like the world Mm -hmm. was so different yeah um so basketball was almost just an element of it but like now that things are back to normal it's weird like it's weird working out and not basketball was so great just to get in the gym and shoot or run or do a a certain drill and it was like you knew you were going to get the shot and the offense or you knew you needed to have this level of fitness to Mm -hmm. compete and now there's I don't know if you felt the same way now there's like none of that so I'm searching I feel like I'm searching for ways to set goals for myself something like tangible to work towards yeah but it doesn't it just doesn't feel as meaningful as it did like to help the team now it's like all right i'll do this but then what's next that's such a good point that's such i don't know a good i don't know point. how you feel about it. i'm curious uh, i don't think we talked about this no we haven't but now that you're bringing it up i used to you know i'd be on a run and i'd be like mm-hmm. 
I'm getting in shape for the fourth quarter. Uh -huh. You know, I'm getting in shape so I can push that extra mile in practice or push that extra for those extra 10 minutes in practice. Or it's like you're in the gym, you're like, or you're lifting weights and you're like, so I don't get pushed around, mm -hmm. you know, smallest player on the team. Like, so I don't get, you know, knocked, knocked around. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you're in the actual gym and you're shooting and you're like, so I can hit that shot when I get that shot, mm -hmm. whether it's in practice or a game or whatever. So I can hit that. Nowadays, going for a run to go for a run, like, no, yeah. there's, there's no, what yeah. was the purpose behind me just, wasting my last hour <laughs> just breathing so hard and all my joints hurt and <laughs> yeah what's the purpose and then like if you take i mean theoretically right if you take a day or two off it's not going to hurt your fitness you know whereas like no. in basketball if you take a day or two off it's like mess up your whole routine yeah you feel like you can't breathe anymore yeah on the court right where it's like all right i just won't go for a run today mm -hmm. and it's like yeah that's such a good point. So how yeah. have you dealt with that? What has that been like? I thought you were going to tell me no. <laughs> the answer. I don't know. I mean, even here in Cleveland, like, I love when we go to shoot. But, like, there's no gyms yeah. nearby anyway. Yeah. So it's like I can't even, even for this league, not that I would get up the same amount of shots yeah. that I used to or, like, that I even could right. yeah. or want to. But, like, you can't – I don't know. Like, I'm – training for that half marathon i know you're running now too but it's like not something that i'll ever be as good at relative to like as good at basketball yeah that i was so that's frustrating and i'm like well what do i do after this half marathon right i don't know like what is run another good? one <laughs> yeah like just i don't want to keep running that much for the, next, yeah. <laughs> for the rest of my life so right. i don't know i don't like i don't know if you found anything but i definitely don't know i'm just finding new things i think i do one thing work towards it completely switch it up yeah and i think like once i finished playing at least like yeah once i finished playing my um my the the number one thing i i started doing is i started like lifting and hitting the gym every day uh -huh. and then i put on 25 pounds i was really? like really what the heck <laughs> Like, I'm 25 pounds heavier than I was when I played basketball. It's because I, I didn't play basketball for a year and a half after I stopped. I just started playing. Like, when we started playing uh -huh. in January, that's when I started playing basketball again. Just because it was so hard to, like, I kind of went through a similar thing. I don't think I touched a ball for a while. Yeah. Yeah, like, I literally just started touching the basketball in, like, maybe late December, early January. Got your shot back so much faster. I feel like <laughs> I still lost mine. No, no, no. But like, and it's hard to get back into it mm -hmm. because, like, man, I've seen where this game has taken me before, and I just mm -hmm. can't go there anymore. You know, like, I'm not gonna be able to play college basketball again. I'm not gonna be able yeah. to, you know, go to the park and play with my buddies for five hours a day and then go to the park again the next day like i can go yeah. i can go one day but i gotta go to work the next day or i have this mm -hmm. event or that event or whatever is going on like you got responsibilities mm -hmm. now before basketball or whatever sport you're playing at the time was your only responsibility yeah and now too like i mean it's easier for me to still like play with guys yeah and get an elevated level of competition mm -hmm. which is both good and then frustrating when I don't play at the same level. Mm -hmm. But like you, you pretty much always have to play down yeah. too in competition, which must be like even more frustrating. Well, the weird thing about it, and like now that I'm playing again, is that like I've never been the best player on my team. No matter what mm -hmm. level I was on, I was never the best player on my team. Um, some sometimes I was never even close. Probably but from I, being in Syracuse. Yeah. You got a caveat. That. You live somewhere else that probably wouldn't have been true. Right? Yeah. Like if I, well, my, my high school is a very like well-known big time basketball program. Like, you know, a ton mm -hmm. of state titles, ton of sectional titles. Like we were a really, really good team. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of division one caliber players come through the program. So 
you know, not never being, I could have went to like a really, really small rural private or whatever mm-hmm. school and been the best player, but like, that's never been me. Mm-hmm. You know, I've always wanted to have other good players around me because then that I think elevated my game. And then you want to win. Like, yes, you trade being scoring however many more points for a championship oh, like any day. Easily. And that's, mm-hmm. that's what, I, that's, you know, I didn't choose to really do that. I just like went to a good high school, had really mm-hmm. good players around me. And so I found a role and I got good at it. And then it took me as far as it could. Mm-hmm. And um, I found my role at different spots and different levels. And yeah, that's a good question. So like now that when I play pickup or I play mm-hmm. in men's league, it's like, okay, you're expected to score a majority of the points. You're expected to be the guy. I'm just like, I've never done this before. Like, I'm, I've always been a mm-hmm. pass-first guy, you know? That's one of the most frustrating things, I think, even, like, just talking about roles. Mm-hmm. Like, within a team context, forever playing basketball, you knew your role, and your teammates knew their role. And if they didn't, the coach or you would put them in their role. Like, yep. if you took a bad shot or a shot that was not within your role, yep. you know. Yeah. Like, but in pickup or like within a Men's context league, yeah. where people like pay to play, mm-hmm. you still can do that to some extent, but not not to the same amount, right? And if right. you're all paying to play, or everybody's playing relatively, yeah, everyone's equally. expect yeah, everyone's expected to play their minutes. Everyone's expected to get their shots. Um, you know, it, it's a completely different just context and almost a completely different game. It's still the same game, but it's like mm-hmm. it, you're playing it in a different way. Yeah, and I hate to, I mean, some people, like, we've been on a little bit of a losing streak, but, like, playing in a team and people go check the score sheet. Oh, man. Or yeah, the, like, I don't care. Don't like, show me that. Like, I don't care. Yeah, you know? I mean, just, do you not want to, I don't know. I think that's that's why I love basketball, playing within – team and overcoming and being able to win because i don't Mm -hmm. think i've always been on the best most talented team Mm -hmm. but a lot of times i've been sounds like you too like been on the best team yeah and we've like when you play together and you're just rolling yeah like as an individual it's really hard i feel like to ever especially unless you're caitlin clark and the ball's going through you on every possession yeah or you're running plays to get the ball in your hands and you're just can't miss Mm -hmm. but there's been so many more times as a team where you're playing so connected yeah you just feel like you can't right and you don't care who shoots one shot you don't care who plays what role Uh you don't care what minutes you get like it don't none of it matters it's just like Mm -hmm. at the end of the day all that matters is that we win and i think if you implement that sort of mindset in a men's league setting or in a pickup setting it would not be conducive to the game um it wouldn't make would make sense to play like that it wouldn't Mm -hmm. make your teammates happy it wouldn't make you happy like i can't apply that same mindset i had four years ago to playing now it just doesn't work well it's hard because it's almost like you know if you pass to a guy in a certain spot that really should be the pass before the assist Mm -hmm. the ball's gonna get stop or it's <laughs> yeah. going up so right. it's almost like okay now do i make the right pass mm-hmm. for a bad shot that might go in five percent of the time yeah. or do i try to make a much tougher pass to get it to the right person to get the shot off mm-hmm. but maybe the ball won't get there right or do i just dribble it out right <laughs> <laughs> i don't know it's like what do you like yeah. it changes the way and people just aren't like even just if you drive driving along the baseline, no one goes corner, you know. Yeah. Or like little things like that, no one tees up yep. either. Like you don't have. No the, one throws the one more. No. Yeah. So it's mm-hmm. like, how do you play basketball within a system within no system when you've yep. always played within a within team a, system? That's a very good point. I don't know. I don't know how you do it. That's what right. I'm trying to tell you. Come out and play with us tomorrow, because then at least we'll be <laughs> we'll be on the same page. Right. Right. And yeah, I. I wish I had the answers because mm-hmm. I'm just now getting into like this post grad basketball or this, you know, this pickup sort of men's mm-hmm. league 
um, mentality, I guess, mm -hmm. and learning the game as I go. And I wish I could give you the answer. Like I, I, I did. I don't know how to explain it. It's. It's something that you have to just learn and keep learning. And then I think the biggest thing a player like you or I can take from it is mm -hmm. that we just have to find our new role and like learn how that applies to the different types of games we're in. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be hard to do just because like, you know, teammates are constantly changing. Outside factors are always changing. The context is always changing, whereas like before, it's like your school versus my school. Let's go. Yeah, it's not so, the same. So different. Even like, I mean, you're really good at this, but I always love like as a shooting guard, you almost always get the ball, or you should get the ball. You're attacking off a screen mm -hmm. or off a closeout. Yeah, which I'm so comfortable doing. Right, but not necessarily just have the ball, bringing the ball up. Yeah creating but in order to get the ball off a screen off close out you need somebody to set you up yeah to set yeah. you up but if you can't play within that context it's a totally you're starting in a totally different spot yeah but you can't even get the ball in the position that you're most right comfortable. yeah yeah in yeah it's it's a lot it's what I, it is <laughs> right i'm glad i can have someone to talk about this with because yeah it these are a lot of things that I'm noticing too in the game mm -hmm. and, and since I've started playing, playing again, but, and then you're talking as someone who prefers to be set up and then me being someone who prefers to be the set up person. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, I'll make this read. I make this pass. And normally this outcome happens. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it never, almost never mm -hmm. happens that way. You can drop a dime across the court and you never know. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen in these games. And it's like, ah, oh, man, like sometimes, you know, it's a blown layup. It's a missed shot. It's a turnover here. And even, even some mm -hmm. of the time it's my fault for even doing it. So, yeah, I'm, uh, we're, we're learning. We are, we're learning. And, and that's, that's all it is. That's all we can do. Um, here, I don't want to take up too much of your time, even though we've kind of hit on everything, even though we, I barely looked at this list. I know, um, it's a big list. I didn't even see your list. Yeah. And I guess one thing I probably want to hit on is that we both work for the Cleveland Guardians. Oh, that's we, a big thing. <laughs> we haven't. That's how we know each other. Right, so I guess we haven't even discussed it yet. So what was your journey to, um, Cleveland? How did you find the organization and how did you find your role that you're in right now? It's a good question. I think I always was interested in business and always loved sports. So I've always thought like, Perfect. well, why couldn't I do both? Yeah. But I kind of wanted like a consulting, like business strategy type of role. And everyone that I ever talked to in sports was like, well, you can start in ticket sales or do this. And like, I, wouldn't be able to sell anybody anything like that just wouldn't that You're wouldn't a work salesperson? no i would you buy anything from me i don't know yeah see that's <laughs> a no that's a no right um see so yeah, i did like a year of consulting after school and like had they're really great people there but like the work was just draining mm. i was like i really don't like this and so i talked to um christy corpheus who mm -hmm leads our SNA group just as like I got introduced um with another guy who works on the baseball side major league baseball Sean mm -hmm. Ahmed who's been great amazing mentor just like you should talk to Christy because I'd been talking to him a lot about getting into sports mm -hmm. and she talked to me about her group and I was like wait like one this exists right two she's super cool and then at the end of our call she's like I have an open role what on my team you should apply so I was like, well, it was a little bit early. I was just starting to talk to people. I wasn't convinced of leaving my job yet, but I went through the process, just like talked to a bunch of people at the organization. That's how they get you. I know. And then I was like, at the end, before the like interview process, I was like, I'm going to be so disappointed if I don't yeah. get this job. But I had no ties to Cleveland. Like baseball is not, obviously, I think at this point, not my favorite sport. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but I'm so glad that it all, again, I think everything kind of happens for a reason. It's crazy looking back. It makes a lot of sense. But in the moment, I had no idea where I was going. Yeah, big time. And yeah, everything does happen for mm-hmm. a reason. And yeah, that, that's what that's the thing about this organization is like, you'll go in thinking one thing or you'll go in mm-hmm. believing one thing and then they'll change your mindset and perspective like in a heartbeat just because of how cool and amazing everyone is here. Like, mm-hmm. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah, you were the same, kind of the same thing. Like you were bouncing around, looking at different, places yeah. at all like looking back seems like it makes a lot of sense but in the moment i don't think you would have said you would have ended up here no like working in community impact and now i can't really see myself not touching at least some sort of community mm-hmm. relations or community impact um part of whatever organization it is but you're right it's become a huge part mm-hmm. of my life and i'm sure it's become a huge part of your life too you know what it did for me i don't know if it's done mm-hmm. it for you But, like, I grew up a huge baseball fan. Like, Mm -hmm. I was obsessed with the Boston Red Sox when I was a little kid. Like, I'm, like, dialed in now. Like, I pay attention to all of our signings. I pay attention Uh to all of our prospects. I pay attention to every single game. I pay attention to other teams around the league. Like, I can confidently say, like, Major League Baseball is now, like, the number one sport I pay attention to interesting yeah i'm not that way right yeah (laughs) but i definitely follow baseball more now but i think actually part of one of the reasons why i like it is i'm like that with any tennessee sport like Mm. consuming content i know way too much but i don't know if i could ever and maybe i'll eat my words on this at some (laughs) point ever work for them like i think i definitely could yeah but i think it'd be really hard for me I don't think I'd ever stop working. Right. And I don't think I'd ever sleep very well. I feel Mm. so connected to it. And just like, but if the Guardians lose, um, if they win, it's great. If they lose, my sleep isn't affected. Okay. That night, which I think is good for me. Like being part of a team, getting to really feel like I'm helping, working with everyone. Like I love everybody and being part of the success, but also not feeling the losses as much as i would somewhere else gotcha or if like you felt it in your past yeah yeah exactly but i think for me personally is good because i feel it i'm gonna need you to teach me how to do that because i had some rough nights in the press box like after a game where like Mm -hmm. i just wouldn't move i wouldn't talk to nobody see that's how i normally am though yeah after any other loss yeah (laughs) Turn the lights off. I don't talk to anybody. Yeah. Don't leave my apartment. So I don't know. I don't know if you should take advice from me. I just never yeah. let myself get to <laughs> Right. Yeah. It's it's been a it's it, it oof. I've had some tough moments already one year into this working for this organization. Just like I live and die with my teams. And it's it's a curse and a it's a good thing and a bad thing. Well, means you're not a bandwagon, which is the worst thing that you could be. Right. <laughs> AKA Georgia fans. Yep. Uh, not talking about anyone that we know. Right. And Georgia right, right, fans right, right. are horrible. Bama fans. Yep. Exactly. Not Vandy fans. But Yeah. <laughs> well, they don't have a lot to really be baseball. They have baseball. That's pretty much it. Not anymore. Not this year. Oh really? There's they're, they're still they've almost lost it. A couple, some really bad midweek. Oh man, teams. Oh, I think man. they're on the downfall because they had all those extra scholarships. Yeah, and now they don't. Oh, did they get um in trouble or? I don't know what happened, but I think the playing field—it's level now. Gotcha. I don't know if they had more than the allotment, mm. or if they got knocked down. So. Ooh, interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that about Vandy baseball this year. You normally think Mm -hmm. that they're – but I know, like, programs like Wake Forest, LSU, Duke, North Carolina, like, those are the premier programs these days. Tennessee, don't forget. Tennessee, sorry. Can't forget about your balls. Can't forget about your balls. But, yeah, a lot of really good stuff we've talked about. I guess probably the last thing that I'll finish up on Mm -hmm. is um, do you have any, like, career advice? that you'd give to someone, whether it's basketball related, whether it's 
actual like your work career or like whatever like if a little girl from tennessee is listening to this podcast or watching this podcast what's one thing you'd probably leave her with you got broad listeners yeah. look at that <laughs> um i guess i'll do one basketball one career okay basketball i would say just keep working hard and as much as you can i mean you can't really choose your teammates or your coaches but i think surrounding yourself with good people and leaning on and learning from those people they'll be some of your lifelong friends and mentors um and you will never lose that even though the ball stops bouncing Mm -hmm. the people don't um career i would say don't be afraid just to chart your own path Mm. i think you learn something at every turn like you didn't expect to be in community impact but worked out right you learn something at every turn about what you like you don't like what you're good at what you're maybe not so good at and you don't need to just follow follow the road less traveled if it makes sense Mm -hmm. for you and it probably if it makes sense for you then it's it's probably the right thing to do yeah that's a really good point and that's it's been amazing having you on miranda i appreciate you coming on and you know do you have anything to plug did you have um plug tennessee (laughs) So much right now before the opening round of the tournament. We'll see how this turns out. Um, oh yeah, they, after St. Peter's, yeah, the Peacocks. I still don't know that mascot is from. Yeah, um, good to tell you. Yeah, go Vols, Rick Barnes, great coach, Lady Vols. Um, we'll see. Maybe we'll have a new coach soon. <laughs> oh jeez. <laughs> All right. We'll see how the tournament turns out. No, this has been awesome though. Thanks for letting me be what number seventy-seven. Seventy-seven I'm episode honored. seventy-seven. Yeah, awesome. All right. Well, you did a great job. No, no Instagram or nothing. No Twitter. Oh yeah. You well, I guess know. Miranda Burt underscore twenty-three. I can't yeah. promise I give out good content. <laughs> it's all Tennessee on Twitter. So if you like that, then you can follow. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you for coming on. Thanks, Terrence. Oh, man.